Carol Weston grew up in Brookline, Massachusetts. As a child, she said that her toys were assigned days of exploration, and the finds of her toys were listed in a notebook. Things such as radio tubes during World War II, she found, and amber, and a Chinese carving thrown overboard in the China trade. More recently, Carol wrote to me about herself, I am in love with the animate and inanimate world, the perfect candelabra of the horsetail plant, the physics of the cello string, the whisker of the cat, the smile of the pumpkin, and the friendship of the moon. So some things never change. At age 16, wrote her first poem, a sonnet, Reasons and Ambitions, that Carol said clarified her vision. She went on to be co-editor of a literary magazine at her high school, and she was mentored by British poet George Barker at Breadloaf, who catapulted her into poetry. She, um, Carol said she was also inspired by another top-notch uh, teachers, other teachers, including Robert Lowell at BU in 55, who taught her verse writing and encouraged her to send her poems out to Poetry Magazine. Carol has had some of her poetry recorded, and she gave her first reading her senior year at BU at the Pebble Room of The Rock, which was a Boston jazz place. And after graduating from BU, she went on and received a degree in occupational therapy and worked three years in the largest mental hospital in the world and on Long Island, and became poetry editor for Broadsides in the 60s. One day, she wrote 36 pages of poetry in four hours, she was rubbing poetic elbows in Boston with the likes of Anne Sexton with Micah Eyes and Ted Hughes and Denise Levertov and Allen Ginsberg and made fast great friends with poet and host Jack Powers and has been a vital important part of his poetry community ever since. She has a chapbook of her poems published in the 70s and later met and married John Galloway who is astronomer, physicist and poet and she said that John and I go hand in hand in the universe as he has the ability to teach even me. <laughs> Carol will be celebrating a birthday, a big one. I believe it's her 3 billionth and 78th <laughs> in a few days. <laughs> and she said that um, about life, I run my lips with gratitude over the objects of this world on my 23rd year trip to the sun. She continues to swim two miles on Wollaston Beach in Quincy. And Carol said the only other trip she's ever had to Hopkinton was April 79 to start the marathon here. And she said it was 10 and a half hours of enlightenment. <laughs> <laughs> I've been reading this poem. My, my friend Tambi Mutu, he, he was poetry editor of uh, Poetry London, Poetry London, New York. He had T.S. Eliot and Marion Moore and all these people. Well, he liked to roar in New York. He would roar this poem by, by his friend, um, Keith Douglas. Now, Keith Douglas had the misfortune to go to war, and these are his sketches, and this is his um, tank, Absalom, and his tank, Amorist. And it is interesting that he knew so much about time <sighs> because he did disappear at the end of the war in Normandy. Time eating. Ravenous time has flowers for his food in autumn, yet can cleverly make good each petal, devours animals and men. But for ten den, he can create ten. If you inquire how secretly you've come to man size from the smallness of a stone, it will appear his effort made you rise so gradually to your proper size. But as he makes, he eats the very part where he began, even the elusive heart. Time's ruminative tongue will wash and slow juice masticate all flesh. That volatile huge intestine holds material and abstract in its folds. Thought and ambition melt and even the world will alter in that Catholic belly curled. 
but time who <laughs> but time who ate my love you cannot make such another you can, can remake the lizard's tail and the bright snake's skin cannot cannot that you gobbled in too quick and though you brought me from a boy, you can make no more of me, only destroy. That's written in Wick War Gloss. I don't know, 1941, and he died in Normandy. Sylvia Plath's husband, Ted Hughes, says that he was the greatest poet of his generation. But of course he, anyway. Eh? So John and I were walking through the common <laughs> Pigeons, pigeons be cognizant that you give the people of your streets a companionship that sometimes goes unacknowledged. <laughs> I lie down with the lightning and suck the nectar and ambrosia of other worlds. Now, my, my ancestor, my great, 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 I don't know how many greats, um, he, um, Captain Edmund Gardner, born 1784 in Nantucket, is off Peru, February 1816, age 32. He didn't like the way his man was throwing, he was the captain, he didn't like the way he was throwing the harpoon, so he did it himself. And I, and this is a, a lot from his journal, uh, anyway. I am in the mouth of the Leviathan. His tooth is in my skull. His tooth goes through my tongue. His teeth go through my arm. His teeth destroy my hand. I turn over in his mouth. He spits me out on the deck. My shoes are full of blood. Now somebody here is from Duxbury. I don't know, somebody knows Duxbury. Well, anyway, uh, Linda Crane, our friend from Gloucester, shamanic uh, practitioner. Uh, she was born in Duxbury. Uh, UFO, oh, that's the sign on her door when I moved into 213 Putnam Avenue. UFO to Linda Crane who is no more. Her bare foot in the birthday cake of her 23rd year, she who was born in Duxbury became Miss Duxbury to make the money to buy the heavy guy diving gear she needed. In Cambridge, her blonde hair in luminous strands spreads in the candlelight among the lobster pots of her apartment. She walks alone, who is a gatherer of people. In Gloucester, ten ke ke kettles steam on her stove. The pots and pans are singing. The knives are shining and the bread is baking. She cooks the kelp for us. She gathered it while swimming in the mountainous waves that sometimes heave her on the rocks. In her shamanic work, the spirits shake her body her drum the center of the winds. Over our journeying bodies outstretched under drumbeat, Linda's wild call cuts the air, calling the spirits from north, south, east, and west to move our limbs, to dance the animals inside us. She who imperceptibly is dying leads us into visions. Linda, sleep under the reindeer skin you brought from north of the Arctic Circle when you hiked nine days with your shaman Sami friend, Ilu. Bear is your power animal. In your bear skin you crawl across the floor. In pain, you die in laughter. Your last words, everything is changing. Linda, we follow your leaping and perceptive foot. 
the deer of your being, dance through the wolves of your death. I worked in the biggest mental hospital in the world. Um, I did fail at the Boston School of Occupational <laughs> Therapy, but when I came for the interview, they were so excited that I'd been to the Boston School of Occupational Therapy, they forgot to ask, did I get a degree? <laughs> this, uh, so there's 15,000 patients, the largest mental hospital in the world. And I was, what, an OT instructor, and then I graduated to be an OT aide. Oh no, the other way around. Patient number four, 14,999. I saw a catatonic sitting on a chair. Did World War II knock out of him this power to speak or move? Filled with hesitation, lest I should be killed, I slipped a warm heart-beating kitten into the catatonic's lap. <clears throat> oh, this is after we went to the, um, the conference on color at the um, uh, Sackler Museum, and I've waited all my life for a concert conference on color. I don't know why they don't have them all the time. <laughs> but anyway, I was a little high after it. <laughs> Listen carefully in the upper rafters of your head when you are walking sky high with the rainbow pigments of the wings of angels. Uh, I didn't do too well at the cotillion. I sort of, I, I wished uh, uh, that I was a crab and uh, could crawl across the floor. But um, anyway, I who bit the poison ivy in the woods and in the marble halls at school, let out the scream of my forbidden body, lay on my bed of diaries and books, unaware of the evening dress on the closet door. My mother broke into the quiet of my room. It's time to try on the dress, she said. I rose and howled and fell on the little lavender rug beside the bed. She came down. She came down on her knees beside me on the rug and cried. I, the screamer, walk in on my gentle father's arm. His eyes flit over the sensual back of, of Sally, the girl in front. I, a brow thick with thinking, my body sloped with doubt, walk in among the princesses. Why am I being pulled out of my sacred da darkness into this glare, the boom of this band, terrified to touch or be touched? Well, let's see. The assignment was write an autobiography in five lines. <laughs> Sperm, the Pollywog, my father gave. Egg, the tennis ball, my mother gave. Fall, the step I tried to take. Scream, the voice I tried to speak. Sun, the ball that lifts me by my arms. <laughs> Burning Lake, uh, this is out of Peace Fire. Oh, and Peace Fire was, um, was in Bomb Magazine, so I want to make sure you know that. <laughs> this is Bomb Magazine, and, it, and, and Jack Powers and, and Julie said that it was sold in, um, that it was sold at the Museum of Modern Art. So that was the ultimate publishing as far as I knew. Burning Lake. The Burning Lake is where we, oh, it goes on for 26 pages, but you're spared. Um, the burning lake, which is where we must swim to transform our language into living fire. Oh, and this is also from Peace Fire, which Jack Powers very kindly went around to um, high schools and read aloud. Um, 
on the glistening soil. There is no pearl like slug and grass or stinking ginkgo seed or broken insect wing that does not matter on the glistening soil. There is no deep iron sunset on the quahog shell that does not matter. No world black whelk that does not play the music of the spheres. In Colorado, uh, a scary time. Canary. He sleep, slips the knife into the canary's cage. I lie while guns are held over my head. He breaks the garnet beads around my neck. How can I run through woods and not be caught? Wandering Wodening. Now, she was married to Stan Brackett. I hope she forgives me for saying. Well, like for 36 years. And then he had another marriage. And she, oh, she bought the strip of a mountain. And um, even the dog couldn't get up to the house and abandoned her. Wandering Wodening to Jane Woden, Wo well, Jane Brackett to Jane Wodening. I think you are wildcat, curled as serpent, bear at heart. God of wisdom, hands of perception running like lightning over the edge of the rock, the blade hewed a hundred thousand years ago in Calco. Lone gatherer of people who build your cabin on the mountainside. You break the sound barrier of animal consciousness. Your laugh, dynamite against the cliff of waiting avalanche. And I forgot to say, we went out to the Calico dig in, uh, in 2001. She came from Colorado and met us there and guided us through that. Um, um, what's his name? Olmsted? Not Olmsted. Um, Leakey. Okay. <laughs> Leakey was directing that calico dig for, for, I don't know, seven years or whatever. And um, when he died, the, the money went away. And, he, and that's where I got the figure 100,000, except he said 200,000. And that outrages the archaeologists. Kitty, this cat, excuse me, who lives in our house. <laughs> All day, his teeth on my outstretched hand till supper time. <laughs> oh, well, here's the part. Now, let's see, am I going to, well, anyway. Okay, Peace Fire. Um, this is from Peace Fire. I am in this race, I am a slow beginner, and when I mount the podium, the stars will come in whirlwinds. I walk firefooted beside the among the bands of children, only their voices breathe with my heart and their hands understand my toys. For the first touch of our hands on seashells must be maintained till death. The found stick on the sidewalk is our amulet and the found light dancing on the edge of time on the stage of time is the blues of the inner wolf of our being releasing breath long caught under the volcanoes of the earth and we the instruments through which it pours. No. And we the instruments through which it blows our breasts the volcanoes out of which it pours. We start from mouse size with a nose for candy and we rise to God size with a hand for truth. The, okay. Houses shall be conducted by the plants that rule them and knives and forks and spoons shall follow in their dance. Thank you. Jessie had a certain affection for the macabre. Her toothy grin was ever present to her stories, Jack the Ripper and others in the soup thick 
London fog. Jesse had worked with Lawrence of Arabia during the Versailles Peace Conference ending World War I. She was English and adept in the Arabic language. We first met in that other Cambridge, Massachusetts, in a street front cafe. She recognizable by the two cockatiels on her shoulders beside her wise ancient face, a great raconteur. Soon after, she had me visit her backwoods cabin outside Tamworth, New Hampshire, the size of Thoreau's Walden hut, but full of clutter. Jessie slept outside in a hammock between two trees. Her Cambridge apartment on Massachusetts Avenue opposite Widener Library, her workplace, cataloger of Arabic publications for Harvard, was equally difficult to wend through, a narrow path, passing mountains of books in high ceiling rooms, papers and piled dusty furniture. Jessie collapsed one day on the trail leading out from her Tamworth cabin. A moose came by, she told me, licked her face until she recovered. Jessie's last months in the woods of her cabin, reading and rereading Homer. Her father had learned his Christianity from the early Greek sources, she told me. Her father, before dying, had a student burn many of his last unpublished writings. He did not want young people to waste their lives, she told me. His name was Alfred North Whitehead, the philosopher. Jessie never married. Sometimes she stuttered. As a young woman, she fell, breaking her neck on Mount Washington, climbing, then out by stretcher, living many months in the North Conway Hospital. A mutual friend gave to us a large black and white photo from those young days before the fall. Jessie, corncob pipe in her mouth, smoking. A time came when Jessie had to leave her cabin, her woods, her moose friends. Her last days, she continued to read Homer in Belmont, Massachusetts, a nursing home, still traveling, her own Iliad, her own Odyssey, returning home many years. Mogolieta. Thank you. I tack my way across the deep, queasy middle of the night, breathing in, breathing out, with the labor of someone shifting sails to cross the Atlantic. My only destination, morning. If my breath shook the whole house, my son would sleep through it. His way, wife rests lightly, listening for their newborn child, and sometimes she carries him into this room to be fed, rocks him back toward sleep that was broken by hunger or the strange news of being alone. Then more than ever, I wish to breathe quietly. I pretend to be asleep, propped in my son's reclining chair. One night, a mockingbird woke and began singing. And I saw the baby's eyes fly open in half darkness, searching for the source of the song. The worst nights, I want to crash a hole in my chest like a hero fighting a fire. I dream of flames, of shipwreck, drowning, wake coughing, sputter to pump what the tide should pump. 
without my knowing it or trying. Breathe, breathe. An insufficient cargo for such effort. Sometimes I wake when I am not in trouble. And that is a gift, like the mockingbird singing in the dark. It is hard to live by intention. In this silence, my breath running gently for once, my thoughts loose. I am the odd bird roosting in this house. Not what life needs, but what it gets away with. The baby stirs, croons, too quietly still to waken even his mother. And in our adjoining corners of the night, we chart the unlikely fact of our lives. Peach and pear.